This is the Venturing Angler Podcast. I'm Tim Harden. In this episode, we're chatting with Corinne and Garrison, doctor of Rep Your Water, about Rep Your Water, their passion for fishing, and where that passion has led them with fishing, travel, and conservation. Let's chat with Garrison and Corinne. We're here with Garrison and Corinne, doctor of Rep Your Water. Welcome to the Venturing Angler Podcast. Hi, Tim. Thanks. Appreciate it, Tim. So I think everybody is familiar with Rep Your Water, but for those who might not be familiar, what is Rep Your Water? Well, we're an apparel company. We make all types of fly fishing apparel and accessories from logo wear to more functional technical pieces like hybrid shirts or sun hoodies. Yeah, we have some fun lifestyle accessories, glassware. We have really cool new stuff coming out this year. We can get more into that later. But, you know, all things fishing that you can wear on the water or put your beer in after. Absolutely. And we'll maybe touch on this more later, too. But we we do give back to conservation. And, and that's a big piece of our brand as well as having some conservation groups that we give back to. Uh, locally and regionally, that's been a piece of the brand uh, pretty much since its inception. And when when did you all start? When was the inception? It was 2011, but that was kind of like a, a baby year, you know? Garrison can talk about the, the artist side of things, but that was sort of the year of birth. And uh, then in 2012, we really ramped things up to at least, I think, six hats for sale. So you all started with hats, and they were they were fishing hats with a regional focus at that time? That's correct. Yeah, I was bouncing around doing all sorts of odd jobs, um, but fly fishing had been a passion of mine since I was really young. And so one thing I was doing was guiding in one of our local shops here. And uh, back then, there really wasn't a ton of cool hats available other than like a few big name fly fishing brands and kind of generic hats for that specific fly shop. And I thought, yeah, it'd be cool if there was a hat that visually said, I like Colorado and I like to fish. Um, And this was before the Colorado flag really was the thing that it is today. Yeah. That was like 11 years ago now. And everybody puts state pride stuff on anything now with any activity, but We have one friend who says we invented that concept. (laughs) I don't think we did, but we certainly contributed to the popularity of it. That's right. Yeah. So we, we went, you know, made a couple of hats and it was really just a fun little side project for us. We'd make a few hats and go on a little road trip and stop in at fly shops and see if we could find a manager that would buy a couple of them. And that was kind of it. Usually it was like a weekend road trip. So like Friday night, we'd be in one town, we'd talk to that manager, they'd buy 48 hats. And by the time we were driving back on Sunday, they would have called us and said, hey, we sold all the hats. We need some more. So that was pretty entertaining. That's cool. Yeah, I think I saw you, you, your products for the first time shortly after that. And I remember I was with somebody who I won't name, but he tends to not praise a lot of people and so it got my attention (laughs) when he said this is one of the best things i've ever seen and it's true i didn't even think about the fact that my hat choice if i wanted to wear something fly fishing related was basically to wear the logo of a company or a fly shop or something and here you know using the colorado example i've spent a lot of years fishing in colorado i love colorado i've a soft spot for that the place and so i could wear a hat that has a silhouette of a trout with a colorado flag it it almost becomes about me and a place i love to fish as much you know more than a a company i like to you know whose whose rod or reel i like to fish and that and that was cool and refreshing and new at the time and that was really the the idea behind it i mean obviously we 
our name is more of a recognizable brand now because we've been at it for 11 years, but we don't put our brand name on the front of, I would say 98% of our hats, you know, and that really was what you could get. You could be like, well, I love this rod. I love this reel. I love these sunglasses. I love these waiters. And that brand is on the front of your yeah, hat. Here's a billboard hat. Right. Yeah. And we've really made it to be more about kind of that fishery because we donate to conservation in that area or that person's passion, whether, you know, now we have far beyond just state, um, themed hats we've got if you love streamer fishing if you love brook trout if you you know basically name it and we've got it now including walleye so that's it walter's in the spring line (laughs) yeah but it's also given us a really nice platform to be a little bit more design driven because of that in other words we're not like trying to have everything on the front of a hat be a logo wear piece with the logo right we want whatever's on the front of the hat to really speak to that person person's passion to your point right to represent kind of what they love to do it says rep your water on the side but we're not worried about kind of that uniformity um which is what most low brand logo wear you know ascribes to or at least historically right yeah that's 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 a great point i you know, in the past, it was like, well, I fish Rio line, so I guess I'll wear a Rio hat. And even right. the name of the company, Represent Your Water, is about more than the, the rods you fish. Um, and, and and now that you've mentioned it, I think my only way when I was living in Colorado to represent my love for the state was to wear a samples T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you guys were able to, uh, I mean, I, I moved from Colorado, I moved to D.C., for a short period of time. That's where I'm from originally, but I left DC. And when I went back, there was a lot more pride in, in DC than there had been when I was growing up in the eighties and nineties. And so you would see people with DC flag tattoos, um, and you know, artwork and stuff like that. And you guys did, you you had a hat with the DC flag and a fish. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. Yeah, we did at one point have all 50 states. So somebody could have collected every single state. Then you went from from hats into other things as well. Yeah, we had some shirts early on as well. Um, I don't think we did our best work on shirts back then. We have really tightened up the ship. But, you know, Garrison mentioned that we really focus on design. And not only did he grow up fly fishing and all of that, but he's been drawing at a high level since basically what four or five years old yeah i mean both of my parents embarrassingly good at both drawing. of my parents are artists so it was sort of a a yes or yes scenario like mm-hmm. i was holding a pencil from before i can remember you know so it's one of those type deals right my yeah. dad my dad was an artist and people i would go to these art camps and, and things where he was teaching and, and people would be like oh what medium do you use tim and I didn't, I didn't like, have I one. Yeah. So <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> you went the right direction on that. So getting into your backgrounds a little bit. Um, so you mentioned fishing and design. How did you both make your way to, to this? Garrison has a much more direct path than I do. Yeah, I guess <laughs> I could lead us off there. I mean, pa- fly fishing has been a passion of mine like i said since i was very young and fishing even before that which is kind of odd because it's not a family tradition in my family at all it wasn't passed down i've tried to get my dad into fly fishing since and he he has no interest interest um i've just always loved fish and fishing and been fascinated with it and i can remember traveling when i was really young and just being like focused on the docks and the water like were there fish in there or are you catching these fish what are you guys catching these fish on like i was always into it that has carried over every body of water we drive by you guess you think there's fish in there right (laughs) right so that for whatever reason has just been a screw loose for me from the beginning and then as we touched on you know art um, kind of runs in the family a little bit. And my parents are both artists, very different artists. My mom is a very abstract artist and calligrapher. And my dad is a very high level um, 
like realist illustrator. So two very different backgrounds. I tend to swing a little bit towards my dad's side. Um, but, you know, I bounced around after college, as I mentioned, was doing a number of different things and was guiding and Rep Your Water was such a perfect conduit to combine these passions for art and design and fly fishing while incorporating um, some conservation and sustainability pieces. And that's really what kind of led me into making this a, a big part of a part of our lives. But we wouldn't be here and Rep Your Water wouldn't be a thing if Corinne wasn't on board and bought in from the beginning as well. I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> Telling my story first. That was good. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people have heard, you know, we're both from Boulder, Colorado, um, but we met out at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, like many years ago now. We're very young, but, you know. Yeah, we won't we date ourselves. Many years ago now. <laughs> Um, and we came back to Colorado together after I graduated, Garrison was a year ahead of me and early on in our relationship, it was probably a summer break. I think it was the summer break before my senior year. Uh, he was like, do you want to go fly fishing? This was like a date. We had already had a failed golfing date where <laughs> I hated it. And so I think he was maybe a little gun shy to go on like some other adventure date. Keep in mind, I'm not a golfer. We just went to the driving no, range because I thought it would be fun. It was it not, was not fun. fun. <laughs> but, you know, he's like, you want to go fly fishing? I'm like, that sounds great. Because I was like a hiker. I was a total nature geek. I've always been like obsessed with animals, not just like bodies of water, but you know, I would find tracks in the snow and want to know what it was. So I've always been that type of nature nerd. Um, so the fishing thing seemed a little bit more up my alley than golfing. And I had known a lot of anglers my whole life. All four of my grandparents hunted and fished and not, neither of my parents did. So I have like this massive family history that did not get down to me. So we went fishing and I immediately loved it. I was like, this is amazing. Um, so I was a very quick convert. That was long before Rip Your Water. Um, and then when the design piece came out with, you know, Garrison playing around with some designs of Colorado themed fishing, I was like, we can do this. We can handle this. I've always been good with numbers. And so I immediately took on kind of the more number crunching side of things. And I mean, it's the only baby we have besides our dog. So there it was. Yeah. It, <clears throat> the, the passion you both have for, for fly fishing really stands out to me. And to get back to Garrison's art, um, you know, sometimes even though I grew up with an artist, I struggle to articulate myself sometimes when I'm talking about other people's art. But for me, just as, as a personal experience, when I look at your artwork, it, it sort of, I don't know if I want to say reminds me, but it makes me think more, I think, about aspects of fishing that I don't think about consciously very much. And so, you know, like a brook trout piece or, you know, I suddenly I'm paying more attention to the colors than I would if I caught the fish and released it. And there's that deep appreciation when I have that experience, but it, it seems like you've captured almost every element of something special about fish and, and then, and then you're able to connect it to places. Um, it, it shows a deep passion and incredible detail. Um, well, I appreciate that <laughs> comment and that's a fun one. You know, I think I, I'm really glad to hear you say that because it does that for me, you know, like really observing whatever I'm going to be drawing enhances the experience, right. Of interacting because mm. trout are freaking cool. I mean, one of the reasons why I think fly fishing is so captivating for trout or other species, but let's talk about trout for a minute. They're beautiful and they vary a lot. Like there's so much variation in terms of their colors and their spot patterns. 
they're just cool critters. They have a really neat aesthetic, I think. I'm working on a piece right now that's a series of three brown trout all together on one piece, one from the Mountain West, one from Iceland, and one from uh, from Chile. And it's just sort of a, an exercise in the differences of pattern and color of the same species in, you know, taking on their their plumage if you will from different locations you know um so anyway that piece is is a great part for me and enhances my experience well and hearing you articulate that tim is interesting because i don't think i could have said it that way but i i i 100 know what you mean because you know garrison while he's the the artist it's not happening in a bubble you know a lot of the pieces we're like bouncing ideas back and forth and obviously we're fishing with each other 98 percent of the time and so those experiences are very shared experiences and so we play around a lot with the idea of like this could be a really cool piece and then if there's a piece this could look really great on fill in the blank would it look great on a hat would it be cool in black and white on a shirt um and then the cycle repeats. Once you do that on a product and you see a piece of garrisons, you then see the next fish in kind of a different way. So that's a cool way to think about it. Yeah, it's interesting it's Interesting to hear you say that. And, and Garrison, as you were describing that, um, the brown trout piece, I was looking at the Western Trio native cutthroat trout fine art print on the website. And you see these three fish and the differences between them. And it makes me want to pay a little bit more attention next time I'm fishing. And when, you know, Corinne, when you were describing that, I, it, it made me think about some of your, both of your social media posts in which um, you both often with a, with a photo of a fish will point out unique and interesting and compelling characteristics of that fish. Um, do you think that having what you have with Rep Your Water, it's changed the way that you fish and see fish themselves? It's an interesting question. I think that what Rep Your Water has done, well, it's done many things. Well, one, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that it's allowed us to meet a lot of really amazing people. And those connections have facilitated um, in, incredible friendships and trips around the world. So this little brand that we started has given us, um, you know, a conduit into meeting some of these people that have really changed our lives and friendships that we'll carry with us and, and places that are really special to us. And even on a smaller scale, you know, like, on the social media front, somebody will tag us in a photo and they're wearing a hat that we made, we shipped out. We have one warehouse. We have every hat come in and out of our warehouse. So at some point we interacted with that hat, we ship it out and somebody is fishing, you know, in Washington for steelhead or in Florida for tarpon or, you know, on some of our rivers here in Colorado. And it like unites this cool community, people that we'll never meet, but it's really cool to think about that community piece beyond just like our own personal deep connection friendships that Garrison was describing. So it, it means so much more to us than just like, this is our job and this is our company and we care deeply about the brand, but what it means for friendships and community and all of that is so beyond just a hat you know? Yeah. And it, 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 it almost as it, I'm sure it, it's for some, for some people, it's almost as if having a hat or sticker or a shirt, um, it could be aspirational. Like if they have a, a right. you know, a tarpon for in Florida or, or it might, you know, I, I saw a guy on Saturday, last Saturday morning coming out of the grocery store with a brand new rep your water hat on with a cutthroat on it. And I said, nice hat. And he was, so stoked like i saw him <laughs> a minute later in the parking lot and he was still smiling and maybe he was smiling about something else but he wasn't smiling until i said something about his hat you know it, it's it's the hats are meaningful i think to a lot of people and it's cool that you're able to have that experience too yeah i hope that's true i think that 
it's it's awesome for us you know we get sometimes just some um, personal stories that really keep you going and keep the passion going. I was doing a little presentation um, last night at Charlie's Flybox here in Denver uh, for a great group of guys. And one of these guys was. Um, and he means guys literally, not. <laughs> is Was a men's group. He is a men's group. I want to say that. Because... <laughs> Sometimes. Yes, it was a group of, of men <laughs> in this case. Uh, but anyway. Uh, one of the young men who was there, who is a really cool guy, but he had had some tough things happen. And a couple of years ago was was having surgery and it was very serious and he was in the hospital and it was a dark time. And his mom bought him a Rep Your Water hat. And he came up to me last night and was like, you know, it was a like a big thing for me, like a big piece to like have that in the hospital. Mm. And just a story like that, you know, it's it's so silly, right? That a hat with a fish on it that he really connected with meant a lot to him in that moment. But that type of story is so powerful. And it's what I'm like, well, I don't know how much I had to do with that. You know, credit your mother on this. <laughs> um, but, you know, that type of story really keeps keeps us going and keeps the passion flowing through the, bl- through the brand. And, and you see it a little bit too, you know, on occasional social media posts, for example, where you might have a new product and then someone like yells out an idea of something that might be obscure as if they're seeing their favorite like rock musician for the first time. They're like, you know, born to run. (laughs) But instead it's like, you know, Minnesota (laughs) walleye or or whatever. Uh, Like it's important for people um, that that they're able to to represent their water. Um, That is a, that's a very funny thing for me personally, because I used to be like upset yeah. that somebody had something that we, you know, they were like, I want this, you don't have it. And I kind of took it personally, like, oh my God, I'm disappointing this person, right? <laughs> I'm letting them down. Like I suck and they don't have the hat they want. And then I was able to like reflect on it a little bit and I'm like, well, all this means is this person really likes the concept right? and they feel great about it. They just want this other thing. And so once I took it as like, this is somebody's excitement, it's not them like telling me that I'm the worst ever for not having XYZ state with XYZ species. I mean, we are still a small company. We can't do it all, but- yeah. The New Jersey flu cat is still. <laughs> that I can't just you is called one that of one it. out, yours. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you mentioned it being aspirational sometimes, and we have this debate. You don't have to answer, but you you can have an opinion if you want. We have this debate with you know we have two awesome guys that work with us, and obviously the two of us. And do you think that you should buy the hat? before your trip and you're like getting ready you're like okay well i'm going on my first florida tarpon trip ever i'm gonna buy the florida tarpon hat and it's gonna bring me good luck or do you get to wear the florida tarpon hat after you have caught a tarpon in florida well (laughs) i I have to answer honestly in case my wife listens to this because (laughs) i am famous for like buying first doing later <laughs> there we go <laughs> but yeah, i think the right answer is it depends on the person but it is <laughs> fun people have very strong opinions like oh my god i would never wear that until i caught that fish you know i'm I, all about getting some good juju going like let's get the lucky tarpon hat like broken in let's start getting excited let's get let's fired sweat up. in it a little yeah. bit Put yeah. the work in, and then when you catch a tarpon in that hat, it's going to be freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, or like when you're driving home and, and, and your hat is... <laughs> <laughs> your hat's sweaty and you don't have any tarpon. Yeah, your hat has, has not encountered a tarpon either. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been using tarpon as an example a lot, and it's just because we've been snowed in for so long. Hey, send some of it up here. <laughs> um <laughs> No, it's, it's, and I, and, you know, I know someone who, who started wearing a permit necklace and it was a reminder to her that she would, 
you know, this was her mission was to get a permit. So I think it, I think it works both ways. Yeah. Um, Depends. I better start wearing a permit hat. Like <laughs> yeah. If we're going to make this work. Yeah. I better get going. This is a good reminder, Tim. I'm going to get one off the shelf tomorrow and start sweating. In it. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, how long, how much, how much do you both think about fish? <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny question i mean i love to tie flies as well as fish um i'm a signature tire for umqua these days just a plug there go check out humble a brag that's right go check out a sweet meat <laughs> caddis at a fly shop near you but uh in all seriousness fly tying for me has become like a really important part of my daily routine and it's almost a meditative process for me because it doesn't require as much creative bandwidth as like sitting down to make a painting. Right. But there is always some creativity and decisions involved and something about that, like busy work and repetition is really calming for me. So I'm tying flies most days in the evening after work, selling fish hats and thinking about fish or trying to go fishing um or making fish art so i guess it's a it's a heavy slate <laughs> over here on the thinking about fish portion it, it, yeah. is, is i it... don't tie, but i live with a person who ties every night and i am chief inspector of flies <laughs> so it's a it's a regular occurrence over here though i have had to tie a few flies recently tim it's it's not my expertise but for better or worse they're relatively good flies and they're 100 percent flish fishable but we play a lot of table tennis in the rip your water office <laughs> and on fridays we do a tournament and you know without getting into the nitty-gritty people who lose have to tie for people who win oh nice and I have had to tie two weeks in a row, so that's a little <laughs> Well, the, the question I asked was a, a little bit of a peculiar one, but it was going to lead into another question. But before I get into that question, I have to go back for a second since we've been talking about tying because you mentioned Charlie's Fly Box, the fly shop, which is Charlie is Charlie Craven, the, the famous tire. And Correct. the re he is, I don't think I've ever shared this before on the podcast, but he is the reason I do not tie. I would... <laughs> I would like to tie. I sometimes I'm fishing and I'm like, I wish I was t I tied this fly or made this change to the fly. But the story is, this is I was in my 20s those years ago. Um, I signed up for like a four or six night. I can't remember, maybe three night tying. Thing, you know, group a group with it was it was a men's group, but it wasn't a men's group. Just happened to be. <laughs> that, that was back when every single fly fishing group was a men's group. Now exactly, it's like <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so I got together with, you know, like four other guys and Charlie and we went like pattern by pattern. And so he'd say like, okay, we're going to tie a hare's ear. And then we'd all take the time to tie a hare's ear. And then we'd all look at each other's flies and I'd look at my fly and I'd look at Charlie's fly and I'd look at the bin of very well tied flies that I had just tied. Not, they weren't my flies, but you know, Charlie's hare's ears. And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to buy those from now on. <laughs> so he's such a good tire that he did teach me how to tie flies, but no one ties as well as him, as, and you know, as far as like. Well, that, I... that guy's on another level, but, you know, he he would probably be upset that he discouraged you. <laughs> in Can you... I tell my favorite art story? Yes. Yeah, okay, so Garrison's dad as we mentioned he's a, like a very realistic illustrator right like he can draw a scientifically accurate bird for wow. example um and so when garrison was really young you know he would say you know dad draw me an elephant dad draw me a giraffe whatever and garrison's like four and his dad would draw these beautiful drawings very quickly like five minutes here's a perfect elephant and then his dad would say, okay, your turn now. You draw an elephant. Garrison would say, no, 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 no. And then after talking to some of Garrison's teachers, 
when he was at an art focus school, of course, his dad would like tell the story and would be in the class and see what the other kids were drawing. And they were childish elephants and childish dogs. And so the next time Garrison was like, dad, draw me a penguin. He drew a penguin like a four-year-old would draw a penguin. And then he said, okay, Garrison, now you draw a penguin. And he goes, I can do that. And then drew a penguin. And now look at him. Nice. Yeah, I don't know if the same applies to Charlie. And he should have just tied like a super <laughs> like, <laughs> really just hot mess of a fucking hair's ear and been like, Tim, you can tie you can, this. You can do this. <laughs> no, it was, like, it was the opposite. He was basically like, look, no hands. And I'm like, cool, man, I'm out. <laughs> I do think it's the cutest little, like, baby. Garrison drawing story ever. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He wasn't cocky or anything like that. But it was like the equivalent of you know, I'm the pl- person who's playing guitar three times a year. I don't play the guitar, but I'm just you know. And then yeah. I go sit down with Jimmy Page. And I'm like, cool. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm fly tying is so much about repetition. You know, there's such subtlety and so many little things. It's somebody like Charlie who's been doing it at such a high level for so many years. It's uh, it's crazy. He actually, he so he did like a tutorial video of my umqua pattern and like tied it. And it was like kind of a big moment for me because he like called me up and was like, well, how do you like to do this? Like, do you like to, you know, what do you do with this material? Wow. And I was- like, sending oh my God. photos of Charlie is like running things by me That's while cool. he's playing a fly. I was like jaw on the floor, just like a Garrison's little like, school clearly, boy. However you would do it would be fine. Yeah, I wanted to just, <laughs> what do you think, dude? Yeah. I don't know. Man. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, you tell first. <laughs> what this like, dude, whatever you think, man. <laughs> Shit, I don't know. <laughs> that's cool um no he's he's amazing and uh maybe i'll get back into tying it's, you should i mean if i can do it you can do it tim it doesn't fun. have to be high level flies to be a really fun practice you know yeah now that i'm living in montana like it's not like there's i can go fishing every day sometimes it, i don't want to fish when it's zero degrees so um Although I've never fished every day. That's a bad excuse for not time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Anyway, that original question is how much do you think about fishing? It, 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 your passion comes out so much with rep your water for both of you. And then following both of you on social media, you, you, you can, you can, in a way that I can't describe, you can see the passion in, in your, in your, photos from Colorado and throughout the world. And it, it seems like you fish a lot. And now that and, and now you're traveling a bit too. Um, where has fishing taken you? Where has this passion taken you beyond the company? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of places. I mean, we have literal places. Lo- yeah, literal <laughs> places. Um, and I think like if we both had desk jobs, we would still fish a ton. But it allows us to do a lot of things. And like I said, the people that we've met in terms of more global, far-flung destinations have been pretty incredible. And, um, you know, we love especially South America. Corinne, in her previous real job to rep your water, I forgot that part of my life was a Spanish teacher. (laughs) So she's like beyond fluent, like fluent to the point where when we travel, People are like, no, but like, but wh- where are you from, though? Oh, you know, yeah. they don't quite believe it's that. It's definitely she's... not a gringo accent. Nobody knows what the accent is. Right. Me and Depends on where you are. <laughs> like, wait a minute. No, you're Colombian. No, it's Cuba. But anyway, so Corinne is is fluent in Spanish, and we really love the cultural piece as well. So, you know, that's the one. The food and the wine. Let's not forget the that. food, the <laughs> wine, people. <laughs> Yeah, all that wrapped up into the culture. <laughs> um, but that's one place that we love to go back to and we'd love to spend more time in if we can is is down there in South America. It's a place that we will continue to try to get to as much as we can. And, and I'm just going from what I can remember. You've been to Chile, Argentina, the jungle. Um, oh, you've, and you've even been down to... Here, you go ahead. 
I want to hear it from you, from you guys. You've been to some <laughs> pretty cool places. I just thought of Jurassic yeah. Lake. Yeah, in South America, we have done dedicated fishing trips in the Bolivian jungle twice for Golden Dorado and, you know, the other species that are there, Paku, Yatarana. I caught a giant surubi catfish, which was a good time. Um, then we've been to Jurassic Lake Lodge down in super far south, Argentinian Patagonia for giant rainbow trout. We've been there three times now, mm. um, which is pretty incredible. We rang in the new year there this past year. We've been to Northern Patagonia with one of our brand ambassadors, uh, Santi del Aqua up in Northern Argentina. Well, Northern Patagonia in Argentina. And then we've been to Chile once, trying to get back there as soon as possible. It's an incredible place. That's a spot where I'd like to spend a lot more time. Yeah. It's such a diverse area. There's temperate rainforest. There's La Pampa. There's like just kind of big rivers. There's, I mean, everything in between. You can. I've never been to a place before like Chile where I immediately was like at home and captivated in a little bit of a different way where I could like see myself there for long periods of time. Like a place like the jungle in Bolivia for me is such an incredible experience. And it's also a little bit of a survival mission <laughs> like that. I thrive in the jungle a little more. That, pl oh. <laughs> Fuck. that climate is just like not easy for me. And the whole, it's just a little bit hard, you know, and Chile is like, I just feel at home there. And like Corinne said, there's so much to do. There's so much diversity of diversity of fisheries and so many big, beautiful wild fish around. Love to spend some more time there. It's interesting. That you, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Real quick. I was just going to say, it's interesting that you say that the first time I went to Argentina, I didn't know what to expect in Patagonia. And the first thought that I had was this feels so comfortable. It, it feels like home. And I didn't expect that at all. So it's interesting to hear you say yeah. that about Chile. Sorry, Kurt. Yeah. And, uh, well, outside of South America, we've also been able to fish in Iceland. And we're going to Mexico for a dedicated fishing trip for the first time this late spring, early summer. Oh, nice. What am I That's it. it I got the... Anything? <laughs> <laughs> I got nah, the... I <laughs> Sorry. This last... <laughs> I want to bring up this last trip you, you, you guys took to, um, to Patagonia. It... It, I got the impression, Corinne, that your fluency in Spanish made the trip a little bit more special and and enhanced it in some ways. I mean, for me, always, because my passion before I had a passion for fly fishing was traveling in Latin America. You know, like the first time I went to Mexico, I was nine years old and I had been taking Spanish classes for like two years already. And my parents depended on me to like ask waiters where bathrooms were mm. and for menus and to, you know, translate menus. And so as a very young child, I very much connected with, oh, well, this is something that's unique to me. You know, like I can speak with people that other people can't speak with like these are people that they don't even know what my brother's saying because he didn't really speak Spanish my parents spoke a bit of Spanish but they relied on me more because I was like way more um outgoing in Spanish than I've ever been in English and Corinne is just a good linguist I mean her gra English grammar and grasp of languages in general is a much higher level than mine and we joke that Spanish speaking Corinne is like a little bit of a bolder person than English speaking Corinne definitely um I think she's more fun but <laughs> <laughs> so for me like you know, I spent a lot of time in Guatemala. I studied abroad in Chile. And so for me, getting to Latin America just means a lot. And then you add in this shared passion that Garrison and I have of fly fishing. And it's awesome. And usually when we're doing one of these trips, we're with those people that Garrison mentioned that we've met through the connections of Rep Your Water, whether they're brand ambassadors or owners of lodges or managers of lodges or guides at these places. It's 
like a little bit of a coming home on all of the things that we love. So this last this last trip meant so much as well because it was a trip we wanted to do in 2020. We had it kind of planned in 2019. Obviously, we all know that the world shut down, and so we didn't do it. And so one of our dearest friends is the manager down at Jurassic Lake Lodge, and we hadn't seen him in two years, and we had stayed in really close touch and hadn't seen him, hadn't hugged him, hadn't shared a glass of wine. And so to get down and, like, see him again, it was, I mean, it just meant so much. That's great. It's not just fishing, you know? Yeah, and, and Tim, I, I know you know this, but in our experience in the fly fishing, quote unquote, industry, and I mean that in, in a very broad sense, like the people that are really in it and have been in it and are passionate about it and continue to be passionate about it, by and large, are really cool people. They're not duds. They're really interesting and they're really right. genuine people. Um which is part of what makes the sport so fun is that the people that are really passionate about it are, are really fun and interesting to be around. Yeah. That last trip, we started in Northern Patagonia with our friend Santi and then drove all the three of us together to Southern Patagonia. And we all three were kind of dreading the road trip part, knowing it was going to take us 20 hours. Yeah. Over 20 hour trip. I mean, Argentina is a big country. (laughs) And so we're all kind of like, oh, this is going to be a doozy. And now when we talk about it, we're like, shit, the road trip part was fun as can be. Like we had, of course, lots of conversation, but we'd play games like, okay, top five fish you've caught, like individual fish. Okay, top five (laughs) species you want to catch. You know, we just like, just keep riffing off of those types of conversations. And I mean, before you know it, we've, driven 20 hours and we're out of sandwich material and right we've got to go buy a couple of beers just to celebrate that we made it and that i knew about that road trip and that's one of the reasons i asked that question about speaking spanish it just seems like it that having that opens a lot of doors and you know makes a lot of experiences doable that might not be as doable for others that's pretty cool yeah well I mean, Santi, who drove us, he speaks perfect English. And uh, so, and he speaks better Spanish than I do, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah. But Tim, from my perspective as the gringo, because I'm always the gringo, <laughs> right? I'm always like the guy in the back. It's like, yeah, muy bien. <laughs> so please, like, he oh doesn't God. give himself enough credit on his um, Spanish. But it does like completely, it, I think it's less about like you're able to do things that you couldn't do. And it's more about there's a shift in how people interact Mm -hmm. and in like just the sort of cultural, I don't know, openness attitude. Like as soon as they're like, oh, wait a minute, Corinne is actually like fluent. You're sort of part of the team. That all of a sudden yeah you're right it's like there's like a there's a shift there in terms of how things I mean, go even one example on that trip it was right when omicron started blowing up in argentina and the province equivalent of a state of santa cruz where we were it was our last state we had to get to they had basically a border crossing and you had to prove that you were vaccinated to enter the state of santa cruz so you know, we get stopped at this border cro- border crossing and Santi has, of course, all of his things ready. You know, Argentina has been very used to like these stops and all of that. So he has everything ready. I have everything ready from yeah. the back. Ding dong over here has been fishing for a week. Like I buried <laughs> the duffel bag in the back of this pickup truck under a tarp. Like who knows where this vax card is? Yeah, at this so point. like in Spanish, of course, Santi's like, oh yeah, here's my stuff. And then I hand mine over and he's like, what about this guy? You know, like clearly I need this guy's vax card. <laughs> and, you know, I lean over because I'm in the back and I'm like, you know, we're married. We're from the States. He has the same exact dates of vax that I do. And he, and the guy who's supposed to be checking our vax cards is like, no, that, that makes sense. You guys can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Bailed and out. If it, if 
B, I'd have been like, no, I have it somewhere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have been in jail. And still- <laughs> <laughs> um, when when I brought up your passion for fishing and where it's actually, I was gonna I was gonna switch topics, but I, I can't help but bring up Iceland. Oh, you yeah. guys both seemed really fascinated by those brown trout. Um, and some you- of us be- caught them, and some of us because. <laughs> He did it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sensitive topic, Tim. I should, I should have just moved on. Well. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's give <laughs> let's back let's give Kern a little credit here. Like Kern <laughs> caught some spectacular brown trout in Iceland. <laughs> just had a little bit of a tough go on the front end of the trip. <laughs> the big lake. Carry on. You may ask your question. <laughs> well. It, <laughs> I don't know how to now, but anyway, the, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> when, what it seemed to me, you know, like you've, you mentioned Chile and, and I'm sure you had this experience at Jurassic, but you know, when you go to a place like Iceland, what happens to you <laughs> or with you when you catch one of these Icelandic browns and because it, it's more than just catching a fish. It seems like it connects you to something bigger. Um, Definitely. What's that I like? One of the pieces to me that was really special about Iceland, specifically in terms of the fish, is that they're native there. And they've been there for thousands of years. And there's really interesting and compelling stories about the strains of browns in Lake Thingvolvod. Which is also probably why I took it so personally that I... <laughs> Not catch a brown trout in Lake Thingvallot. But you know, for <laughs> me, it was almost felt like sort of a like a pilgrimage in a way to to see these fish where they evolved because I'm so passionate about chasing them, you know, across the West and in South America, and I've been lucky enough to be you know fish for them in New Zealand and South America and the U.S. All introduced. And yeah, they're non-native. So that piece is really compelling. And then Iceland is just a crazy place. Like the landscape is so surreal and fantastical. The language is impossible. Right. (laughs) So it was like a very um, fascinating trip. And the fish, specifically the brown trout, were really compelling to me. and, And also because they had very unique spots and coloration and life histories all of those things that's cool you can tell we nerd out on a yeah lot and, and and that's <laughs> you know that's one of the things i see in the art and then how it's led you you both fish in state a lot and then and then travel for fish um but part of this passion has also led to one of the deepest commitments to con- conservation that I've seen ever in fly fishing. And I'd love to chat about that too. Um, why <laughs> and how <laughs> did you come to have this commitment to conservation? Well, the why is simple and complicated. You know, like we have a business that depends on natural resources. And I mean, if we're getting into the nitty gritty, unnatural resources like introduced brown trout. Um, but we wouldn't have a business if there were not fish in rivers, if there were not rivers that were, you know, well protected and there were not cold water flowing through those. So very much we depend on a resource that is taken care of by others, including like Trout Unlimited is one of our conservation partners. Um, so from the beginning, we were like, well, we don't want to just be a hat. We don't just want to be a shirt. We want to mean more. Right. And like you were saying earlier in the podcast about like the hat standing for something and, you know, people connecting with it. Like we felt very passionately about like, if we're going to have a hat that is speaking to fishing in Colorado, it really makes sense that the purchase of that hat supports conservation of fish in Colorado. Correct. 
I know that neither of you are likely to boast, and so I'll jump in here and <laughs> say that with portions of sales going to conservation over a year, about a year and a half ago, a little, a year and a half ago or so, you surpassed your goal of donating a quarter of a million dollars to conservation organizations. Yes. And now I'm willing to boast. We are over $340,000 wow. conservation partners. That's amazing. And it, like, you know, say like, we do, I don't exactly remember your quote. You could refer back and give it to us, but you know, we do more than other brands or whatever. And there are certainly brands that give more monetary donation because they're bigger brands. Like Patagonia is the cream of the crop. Orvis gives 5%. Um, you know, even Sims is supporting a lot in their own local watershed that in one fell swoop, they're doing about half of what we've done in our lifetime, but these are huge companies. And so for us, it means more like could Garrison and Corinne put that money in their own pockets? Obviously we're a business, we're run by the two of us, but it doesn't make sense to us because it means so much more to us to be able to support conservation in the places that we love to fish and that our customers love to fish quite plainly. Who are some of these conservation partners? So we have a couple that we call like our regular conservation partners because they are on our 3% for conservation um, program. And that the very first one ever was Colorado Trout Unlimited. Um, and they're all regionally based. So like the Driftless Area Restoration Effort through the National Fish Habitat Partnership, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. The um, Wild Steelhead Coalition. A couple of different chapters of back in their hunters and anglers so it's a total of 14 and they are regional if you basically break up the united states and then the the products that feature something specific to that state go to that conservation partner um and then everything else that's not spe specific to a state um goes into a big fund that we split evenly amongst those 14. and then we have some specialty projects that we do like with the western native trout initiative we have collaborative hats um we also have historically had a no pebble mine hat though you know knock on wood the nails are in the coffin of that um our next big yeah push, we just need to get the hammer out of correct yeah. the next big push on a collaborative hat we have with trout unlimited is the restore the snake hat um and that is supporting the effort to take the lower four dams out of the snake river what else i think that's a good summary that's it that's great <laughs> and and you, you guys stand out for conservation um, but you also stand out for being one of the first companies i've seen who's in, in fly fishing who's made an effort to um be a more sustainably operating business. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I think Patagonia obviously does a lot of great work there. Let's not pretend that they yeah, don't. They have a hand in every <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, but but they're not just fly fishing. So that's true. Yeah, they're not just fly fishing. Yeah, it it was a natural um, progression for us um, to start to think about not just giving back to conservation partners, but telling a sustainability story through our products and trying to work with more um, sustainable fabrics. Um, you know, so we have a number of things that we've added. And, you know, the key for us is like, it still has to be a product that makes sense. And it's high quality. Yeah, it's high quality, that's really functional. Um, and that's at a price point that we think, you know, people can, really get behind you know so we have some really nice like mid-weight hoodies we call them eco hoodies and they're 100 percent recycled products so it's recycled polyester and upcycled cotton blend and they're fantastic they're sort of um like pre-shrunk because of that recycled content like wonderful soft brushed fleece interior you know so that's one example we do um fish mask um we call them the, like, our neck tube product um that's 100% recycled polyester. We have like at least 10, maybe more now, should have brought my data with me, but at least 10 hats that we produce at the factory that has eco-tool fabric. And so the fabric of the hat 
is recycled polyester and organic cotton. Um, so that's adding to the headwear side of things. You know, one little step at a time. When we first started this company, it was like we gave 1% of our sales to conservation. And in some cases, we lost money on that. We were donating more <laughs> than we were making. Very true. Yeah, that was a while ago. But we've always believed that if we just take one step at a time, we will continue to to improve the overall product, the overall footprint, and all of that. We are also are carbon neutral uh, for two years running. And so while it's not a perfect solution, we work with third-party verified carbon offsets to offset every single piece of our production. So that includes every marketing trip we've ever taken, that includes every hat we've ever produced, that includes every shipment we've ever made to a customer. Um, so it takes every little thing into account. That's right. And we should mention also, we have some, they're coming out here soon for spring in the next month or so, but um, really nice lightweight sun hoodies and sun shirts that are 100% recycled, reprieve uh, polyester, great product. You know, for us, it's a balance of really trying to continue to strive for sustainability. Um, and we're, also we're just a small company still. You know, so there's only so much we can do to drive custom fabric production um, because of our volumes. That's right. Um, and it is what it is. But we're going to continue to push there. And we're proud of what we've been able to do in the past few years. It's amazing. That's it's great. And, and it's great. What do you all do as far as giving back to conservation, too? Um, Thank you. <laughs> I live near Bozeman. I almost can't go into town without seeing something rip your water somewhere. You, you all have a more than a quarter million Instagram followers, but for the, or about that, um, for, for those who are not familiar with rep your water, where can folks go to learn more? So the website is rep Very simple. And then we're on all the social media, just at rep your water, R E P your water. Excellent. Well, this was great. I enjoyed learning more and, and I, this was a fun conversation. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. And uh, get out there and do a little bit more fishing up in Montana. Sounds like <laughs> maybe you need to get after it. And also maybe you need to get that fly tying vice out. Tim. You know, <laughs> it, it might be time. It might be time. Maybe I'll go into Charlie's fly box and be like, hey, Charlie, check out these hairs <laughs> ears. And he's going to be like, oh, my God, that was 15 years ago. You're a maniac. But we'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, maybe don't because what happens like me is you walk into charlie's fly box and you end up driving a lot of yeah, money right. <laughs> that's a good uh, idea so right. um, um awesome well thanks for coming on this was fun thank you thanks tim mm -hmm.